Hi, good morning. No, that was that was that was poor. <laughs> good morning. Much better. Are we happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. All right. Welcome, church. It's great to see all of you here. Uh, please take a moment, find a friendly face around you, and greet them this morning. Is that great? <laughs> What's the sweater? 
Oh, it's super Okay, so I forgot. I stopped playing. Yeah. I'm so dreamy. It's like the color goes. I know. It's like this. It's like this. It's like you're wearing maroon. Oh, gosh, no, boys. No, hang in there. Hang in there, boys.
church, as we get ready to sing this next song, if some of us are battling with, with whatever we're battling, um, could be physical, could be illness, could be mental, it could be, you know, stress at work, it could be stress at home. I know holidays with family can sometimes be very stressful. But this family that we have here, this, this Christian family, God chose each and, each and every one of us. We're here for a reason. We're here for His purpose. All that can go away. All that stress, all your worries, whether you feel like sometimes you can't sing because your chest hurts and you can't push out enough breath, whether it's stuff is happening at home and you just don't feel into it today, God is there for you no matter what. He's literally the breath in our lungs. He will comfort us when we're stressed. He'll, he'll cover us when, when we can't go on. He will pick us up and carry us. So no matter what's happening, church, I just pray that you sing this song and listen to this song and feel this song and connect to God during this time. Find a way to worship. Find your connection. Find your path, whatever it is, and worship. And prepare your hearts for Jim's message for God's message when it comes. Prepare yourself for God. Isn't that crazy that we can say that and mean it with all of our hearts, that we can prepare ourselves for God to come inside of us and live here? That's the goal. That's, the, that's what we're here for. That's, that's why we're Christians. That's why we exist, is for God to come inside of us and use us. So take this moment find that connection, find that pathway, just feel God and be with Him.
prepare for communion and to, to give our tithes and offerings. You know, we've, we've made that transition from Thanksgiving. Now we're looking, now we're looking at Christmas, and we're just singing the songs, Great, Great Are You, Lord. In our first service this morning, we began singing Christmas carols. And uh, if you're like me and you've, been, you've had your radio on in your car at all ever since Halloween, we've been hearing Christmas carols. But we, we, we get to that point to where we begin to think of the birth of Christ, the baby in the manger. And as we come around the Lord's table today, we realize that the reason that baby came was to go from a manger to a cross. And, and the thought comes to mind that while, while we celebrate here, consider the gift that was given to us when where Jesus himself leaves heaven, takes on man incarnate, and comes to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. Let's think about the love that it took for him not only to come to earth as a man, but to go to the cross as a man, experiencing all the pain, all the anguish, all that comes with it, so that he could be that perfect sacrifice for each and every one of us to have eternity in heaven with him. So as you take these emblems, think of the love that he has for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity. And Lord, when we think about the love that you had for us to, to willingly go through all that you did, Lord, help us to, to realize the benefit the promises that came from that, the, the assurance that we have in, in knowing that, that, that our future is in your hands and to realize, Lord, what had to be done for that to take place. So, Lord, as we take these emblems this morning, help us to be mindful of the love you have for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, obviously, this is the first Sunday of the month and has been our practice uh, for the last several months. I want to give you an update on our More Than Bricks campaign. So, uh, Peanut, there you go. So, More Than Bricks, uh, for those that might be visiting with us or haven't been paying attention for the last year, which I find that hard to believe, but we started a campaign back in March to focus on the mortgage payment for this building. Uh, most of you already know that we do have a mortgage on this building. It's still at about $1.4 million. And we do have a monthly mortgage payment of $7,688. So back in March, uh, we kicked off an effort to try to focus on that. We asked all the congregation, we asked you and you and you and you, me, to step up more and more by your tithes and offerings to give more and more a mortgage fund so that we would have enough to uh, pay our monthly mortgage payment. And so if, if you can get to the slides, got the chart on it, Peanut. Uh, next one's good. Uh, as you can see, when we kicked off this chart, this, this, the program in March, uh, the March numbers was way up to you know six thousand seven hundred twenty-seven dollars. Previous to that, through all of 2018, we were only averaging about four, a little over four thousand dollars a month. Again, giving uh, to our mortgage fund, as we call it at the time. Now we're calling it more than bricks. Uh, as you can see, for since March, we've done a tremendous job. You've done a tremendous job of stepping up uh, and contributing more to our, our mortgage fund. Uh, I have to say for November, which is the vertical bar on the right, we fell a little bit short of our target, which is our mortgage payment. But I'm so optimistic that we're going to more than make that up in December for a couple of reasons. One, it's five Sundays in December, which is good. Uh, but two, it's a year in. So I'd encourage each, every one of us to think about stepping up a little bit farther by the year, end of the year, making a little extra contribution towards our mortgage fund. Uh, we want to get that number well below or below 1.4 million soon, very soon if we can. So I just encourage you to uh, consider that, prayerfully consider that. Uh, you know, the Lord has blessed us with a great facility here. But as with, He's blessed some of us with great homes, they're not free. And it does cost money to even do our monthly operations of our church, our staff, or whatever. But it also, we have a mortgage to pay. So I try to just share the facts with you and again encourage you. Thank you for everything you've done so far. But I just ask you to continue to focus uh, on our mortgage payment uh, because it's still a long term, long time until we're going to get the building paid off. But I don't think anybody can argue we have a fabulous facility that the Lord's blessed us with. He has blessed us so many ways over the last 15 years. We've been here 10. He blessed us several years before that with lots of things to make it possible that God's family could be a church, a church family here on Goggins Lane. And so I don't think anybody can argue with that. We do have a great facility. So with that, I'm going to just say thank you again to every one of you. Please, thank you. From the, from the leadership of the church, we thank you so very much. And with that, I'm going to dismiss for Children's Church. And then I'm going to turn it over to Jim. To, he's going to bring our morning message. His message this morning is looking back, looking forward. He's keeping his scriptures from Matthew 20. So if you want to get that ready while the kids are leaving. Jim. Morning, church. Take your Bibles, go with me to Matthew chapter 20. The, uh, as George mentioned, we're, we're going to be looking back and looking forward. And I, I, I don't know how many of y'all enjoy this, but, but I do. I, I like sports. And this time of year, a lot of the shows will go back and show all the highlights that have taken place during this year. And by the way, we had some really good ones yesterday. Amen? Jake's not here. The, uh, the, the thing I want us to look at today is as we, as we look back over last year ourselves, think of what our life has been like. The ups and the downs, all, all that's involved in that. And as we look at that, it helps us kind of look forward. And what, what do we want to see take place next year based on what has taken place last year? You know, we're only 30 days away from 2020. And, and there's something magical about New Year's Eve. We all get together, the ball drops, the old's gone, the new's here, 
It's a new chapter in our life. It's a new beginning, and we celebrate that. But if you're like, if you're like Holly and I, we set the alarm for midnight so that when we fall asleep before that, we can wake each other up and say, Happy New Year. But as that new year starts, there's a, there's a sense, there's a, a feeling of, of fresh beginnings. And I was thinking about that, and, and as I was reading Scripture, just happened to come into this passage this week and, and, and saw this, I thought, Here's a great illustration of what it would be like to look back and look forward. So if you will, go with me to to Matthew chapter 20. I want to read verses 29 through 34. And I'd like to kind of take a little different approach maybe this morning and do this more like a Wednesday night Bible study than than a Sunday morning sermon. We're going to read it in its entirety, then go back and kind of dissect verse by verse. So Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 says, as they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him, being Christ. And two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet. But they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Pray with me. Father, this morning, as we read this passage, I pray that you open our eyes, that you, that you help us to see what is in here that we can take to heart, what we can do with the, the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit that is to teach us all things as we, as we, we sit at your feet this morning to, to be taught Lord, help us to see what is in this. Help us to see ourselves and to to see our future in your eyes. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go back and look at at, at 29 and 30. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him, and two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, what I like to do when I study, and most of you all know this, I like to put myself in that place. And it says, a large crowd was following him. And and I want us to see ourselves from two different perspectives. Let's see ourselves in the crowd that that follows Jesus. And then also, it goes on and says there were two blind men sitting by the road. Let's put ourselves in their place too. So as we look at this crowd, you can kind of equate the crowd, those who were following Jesus— Fast forward to today, who follows Jesus? Church. So let's look at the crowd as the church. And they were following Jesus. Now that that begs the question, why? Why were they following Jesus? What do you think? Curiosity? They heard that he could do miracles. He could heal the lame. He could, he could raise the dead. He could, he could do all these things. Do, 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 we, do we follow him to see what he can do? Do we follow him to, to be entertained? Are we curious about who he is? Some had said that, that he was teaching a new, a new religion that was opposed to the religion that was about in, in place now. He was talking about forgiveness and mercy and grace. And that was, that was in the face of the old sacrificial system. So maybe they just wanted to know who this guy was. But I also believe that there were those who were truly following him because they recognized who he was and what was taking place. So if we're in that crowd, why are we there today? Why do we follow Jesus? They're walking by, and these two guys, these two blind men, we don't know how long they've been blind. We don't know how long they've been there. But these two men who were without sight cried out to Jesus. They knew who he was. They said, Lord, son of David. They knew who Jesus was, and they called out to him. Now, here again, why? Because they knew him. They had heard just like everybody else had heard. He he can actually heal people. He can work miracles in people's lives. So as we sit by the roadside... Why would we cry out to Jesus? Do we know who he is? Do we know what what he's capable of doing? And I think that that paints the picture of 
of the, the situation as these people walk by, these guys are, are yelling for Jesus. If you go with me to verse 31, it says, The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more. If we were people that were following Jesus because we knew that he could work miracles and he could change lives and he could do all of these wonderful, amazing things, why would we tell two men who were in need to be quiet? We don't do that today, do we, in church? Do we, do we tell people because they're not walking along with us? Because maybe they're of a, of, of a different upbringing or, or a different culture or something else that, that kind of separates us in our own minds? If, we were, if they're not with us, would we tell them to leave Jesus alone? Surely not. So why would they do that? Didn't seem to stop them. It said they told these, they told these two men to, to be quiet, sternly, to be quiet. But it says they were, they were all the more determined and cried even louder. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And if we look again as our, at ourselves as these two men, when we cry out to Jesus, notice what they're saying here. Have mercy on us, not restore my vision, not get me off this roadside, not do other things. Have mercy on us. What does that mean? It means that these two men were in such a state that they knew that without Jesus' help, they had no hope, no future. So they said, Lord, we're putting our lives in your hands have mercy on us. We'll, we will accept whatever you do with us. Have mercy. We haven't earned anything. We don't deserve anything. But we know that we can't go on the way we are. Have mercy. Is that what we do? You ever been in such a, a state that you know you can't go on the way you are? That you know that your future is shot unless something miraculously happens and Jesus comes along and we see him for who he is and we know what he can do. We know what he's capable of. And so we say, Lord, whatever you want for me, please, I can't go on like I am. I don't see any hope for myself. You take my life and do what you think should be done. I'm at your mercy. I think we've all been there. But I think it's interesting. Watch, watch what goes on and happens, happens next. If you look at verse 32. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? Isn't it obvious? They're blind. So why would Jesus say, what do you want me to do? I mean, I think it's I think it's pretty apparent. But these men have just said, have mercy on us. Lord, we'll accept whatever you do. Now it's changed. Now it's not just that they have seen Jesus go by and they know he's capable of doing miraculous things. Now he's asking them specifically, what do you want me to do for you? And I want us to look at that question too, because he says the same thing to us today. Look at, look at John chapter 14, 14, and there are many other verses, but this one is the first one that came to my mind. It says, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. So family, here this morning, Jesus is asking us, what do you want me to do for you? Specifically. Now, how do we answer? We've been saying, Lord, just get me out of this mess. I'll accept whatever you have in store for my life. Lord, please just deliver me from whatever this is that, that, that is causing me to lose my hope and my future. Now he's saying specifically, well, what do you want me to do? 
Does your answer change? Did theirs? They went from, Lord, whatever you want, whatever you want to do with me, please do, because I can't go on, to now they're saying, I want my sight. What do we say? Lord, get me out of this mess. Well, what do you want me to do for you? Well, I'll take that new job. I'll take that bigger house. I'll take more money in my bank account. I'll take, the, I'll take deliverance from this. I'll take that. Specifically, I know what I want. So now, when he says, what do you want? We tell him what we want for us. No longer are we thinking about what he wants for us. We're talking about what we want for us. But if you watch, look at what Jesus says here. It says, immediately he was moved with compassion. Those three words. Moved with compassion. Jesus loved those men. Jesus loves us. He wants what's best for them, and he does for us too, according to his will and his plans. So when he looked at these men, he saw what they were, and now he sees what they can be. These men were blind. They couldn't see. Now they had the opportunity to see. And if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, In their case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. They said they wanted their sight. And what I want to ask you this morning is, do you want your sight? Now, I know there's probably some of us in here who have poor vision. There's some of us in here who have good vision. I'm not talking about your ability to see across the room. I'm talking about your ability to see what the Lord has in store for our lives. Our spiritual sight. If you look back over the last year, look at all the things that we've been through, the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs. How often back then have we been blind to what the Lord could do in our lives? How often have we kind of sat by the roadside and just begging, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. And all the while, we had the ability to see what He has for us. But now, when He says specifically, what do you want me to do for you? Based on what we've done last year, I would say it would be a really good request. Lord, open my eyes. Lord, help me see. I've been blind for so long. Help me to see things the way you would have me to see them. Help me to not to have that mercy for me that you're giving me. Help me to see my life in your will. Like Christ who prayed in the garden, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. How often would we say that and mean it? How often have we been blind to that opportunity? Then look what it says. I think this is good too. Moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Immediately. Here's where it gets a little involved. Just as Jesus asked these men, what would you have me do? He's asking the same of us. And if we were to say, open my eyes, we could immediately see what he wants us to see. You ready for that? When, when it says that a key word there, immediately. He didn't say to them, you know, I'm going to give you an opportunity here. We're walking out, we're going on a little trip, and when we come back, I'll stop and then let's talk about what your life's been like in anticipation of me coming to heal you, what changes you've made in your life, what, how much better you are. And if you've, if you've reached that qualifying, qualifying spot, yeah, I'll, I'll heal you. No, he didn't say that. He loved them to the point that he gave them their sight right then. Do you think he loves us any differently? Do you think that love for these guys is more than the love that he has for us? No. So, 
moved with compassion, he tells us, whatever you ask in my name, according to my will, I'll do. When we say, Lord, I want my sight, he'll give it to you. If it's in accordance with his will, you got it. So now what? When, when we look at this, and we see things differently now than we did before, what changes will take place in us? What's next year going to look like? Based on what we've done last year, where we were blind and didn't really see what was going on, what the Lord had going for us, all of a sudden we see it. Now, what's our future going to be like? You know what these guys did? Again, immediately, they followed him. They didn't go home and put their stuff in order. It says immediately they followed him. This crowd was walking away from Jerusalem. It says they were leaving Jericho. They weren't preparing to leave Jericho. They were leaving. And these two men immediately followed him. So what's that put in our laps? How are we going to respond to what he says? If you go to Isaiah... Chapter 6, verse 8. <clears throat> He's in the presence of God. Imagine that. Right here, right now, we've come together. Two or more are gathered together. He's here. And He's saying, what would you have me do for you? Isaiah was in a similar situation, and he heard the Lord God say, th it says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, send them. No. He said, here I am. Send me. If we want the Lord to open our eyes, if we want to be more Christ-like in our life, and we tell the Lord, that's what I want, your mercy, whatever you want for me, that's what I want in my life. Open my eyes. Help me to see that. Help me see the direction you have for my life. And he says, okay, you've got it. He immediately, we begin to see those things. Now what do we do? We follow him. What's that look like? Peanut, if you will, get that, that, that clip ready for me. Jesus is saying that past, it's gone. It, it's, it's not there. All you have now is me and your future. And there's an old movie that I watched that I loved it. And I think it illustrates this point very good about what we do with the future. So if you will, show that for us, please. Now, my friend, the first rule of Italian drive. What's behind me is not important. What do you think? What's behind me is not important. How often do we let our past darken our future? These men, even though they were no longer blind, they had their sight. How do we compare with that if we're blind and now we can see? Will we allow that past blindness to darken our future. New creation in Christ. We have, we have the opportunity right now, right here, to have the Lord open our eyes, change our hearts, move forward. We don't have to wait for January the 1st. There's something magic about January 1st. I said that before. How many of us here, you know, we come to this time of year, we're getting about 30 days in, then do we know there's a new year coming? We begin to make New Year's resolutions, right? I make them every year. January 1st, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to be a better person. So what do I do December 31st that night? Yeah. I eat myself sick. And then I'm too, I'm too, too heavy, too, too bloated Monday morning the first to start doing anything about it. And, you know, my birthday's coming up, and, you know, I, I, you, we just begin to, everything goes to pot. We don't have to wait for January 1st. 
that, that's, that's the thing that we've created. What about December 1st? What about right here, right now? We tell the Lord, Lord, open my eyes. I want to be more like you. And he goes to work on us. So that when January 1st comes, we've already hit the ground running. There's, there's nowhere in Scripture that I can find where it says there's a 30-day waiting period. This says immediately. This says now. This says here. Now, what I want you to consider, and we're about to close. We're going to sing our invitation hymn here in just a minute. Right here, right now, what do you want the Lord to do? I would imagine most of us want to be more like Christ. Most of us want to have the love of Christ in our hearts. Most of us want to, want to get over all of this blindness that we've had before. We want, to, we want to have a new life, a new start, fully able to see what the Lord would do in our lives. And he's saying, okay, are you ready for it? What would our lives be like if we walked out of here that rear view mirror thrown away. What's behind me is not important. And we began to live the future. Not for us, but for the Lord. It's something I believe, I truly believe. It's something we have always wanted, but we've never really asked for. We've never had the courage to say, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. I want to see. We're going to sing our invitation to him, as I said. And when we do, I would like for you to consider right here, right now, rather than down the road or whenever I can or whenever is more convenient. We've always wanted this. We know it's what he wants for us. We know that it would, it, would, it would make us better people. It would make us better Christians. We would, have, we would be stronger in our faith and closer to the Lord. And that's what we've always said we've wanted. And now he's saying, what would you have me do? This is that free will choice thing again. We can say, I want to be more Christ-like and not do anything about it and not ask him. Or we can say, Lord, heal me. I don't want to be blind anymore. I want you to live in me and help me see through your eyes what you've called me to be. Pray with me. Father, this morning as we come into your presence, we read this account of these, these two men that were blind. And they cried out to you for mercy. They knew the position they were in. They knew they were blind. They knew they had no future. But Lord, they heard you were coming by. And when they heard your voice say, what would you have me do? They wanted to see. Lord, I think we just, just like the church that was following him then, Sometimes we tell each other to be quiet, or sometimes we, we want to go along with the crowd rather than the crowd's instruction, rather than your instruction for our lives. Just like these two men, help us to ignore all the things around us and to focus on you and the ability that you have to heal us. And help us, Father, to, just as they did, say, we want to see. Lord, I pray that you remove the blindness from our hearts, open them up to the opportunity and the life that you have for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to, to see the, the chart, the, the path that you've charted for us, and help us to, to take that direction for our lives to where we don't have those, any more regrets, we don't have any more guilt, we don't have any more shame. That's all been behind us. Lord, help us to look ahead at what you have for us and to see it plainly and pursue it with all that we have. Lord, that means change in our lives. Father, we know that you give us the ability to overcome those obstacles. So, Lord, just as these men said, we want to see. Heal us. 
deliver us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you will, please stand and let's sing.
Why don't you just be seated for a moment?